Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the program where we channel our inner prospector. We pick up our tin pan and we stick it into the burbling stream of news headlines about the Vatican and the global Catholic Church, looking for those few nuggets of gold over the past week. Here's what we've got for you on this edition of the program. We begin with a new tune on transitions. At the beginning of his papacy, Pope Francis seemed quite often to dangle the prospect that he would resign the papacy, and then in fact resignations had become a sort of normal thing in the life of the church. Recently, however, his tune on that front has changed. We will try to make sense of what might have happened to explain that. Second, the tribulations of the trial. The Vatican's trial of the century trundled on this past week with two more hearings, neither one of which were necessarily great news for the prosecution in the case. We will explain what's going on there. Third, who done it? The case of Jesuit father Marco Rupnik, the famed artist and now also accused of sexual abuse and misconduct. His case was back in the news this past week, and attention has come to focus on the particular question of who lifted an excommunication that was imposed on Rupnik, a question that at least to this point is without an answer. We'll explain what rides on the answer to that question. Then two points motivated by the looming 10-year anniversary of the Francis papacy. One, cardinals who aren't. Why speculation about who might follow Francis is complicated not by who is in the College of Cardinals, but who isn't. We'll unpack that. And then finally, his top five trips. The top five most consequential trips Pope Francis has taken over what has been, ladies and gentlemen, undeniably a dizzying decade of papal activity. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's show, so please stick around. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, February 22nd in the year of our Lord, 2022. We begin this week with a changed tune on transitions. So this week, the Vatican released the text of a meeting that Pope Francis, actually two meetings that Pope Francis recently held with his fellow Jesuits while he was on the road in Africa. The Pope, of course, visited the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. And as he does on all of his international trips, he sat down with local Jesuits to have a kind of informal conversation. And the Vatican typically, several days later, will release the transcript of these exchanges. And so this week, we got them from the DRC in South Sudan. Now, in most respects, these conversations anymore are very familiar. They tend to cover themes near and dear to the Pope's heart. You know, his strong missionary instinct his concern about a third world war being fought in sort of piecemeal fashion, his concern for migrants and refugees and so on. But in the conversation with his fellow Jesuits in Congo, and of course, remember, this was just a couple of weeks ago, basically late January, early February, the topic of resignation, papal resignation, came up. Now, of course, this is a topic Pope Francis has addressed multiple times throughout the course of his papacy. And we all know early on the kinds of things he would say. I mean, for instance, in a celebrated 2015 interview with Televisa, Mexican television station, Pope Francis had said that he suspected that his might be a somewhat short papacy. He said, I don't know, but I'm thinking a few years. Beyond that, he talked about the resignation of his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, said Benedict XVI was very courageous for having uh, stepped down and said that heretofore, that is in the future, going forward, papal resignation should not be exceptional. Said now Benedict XVI had made it an institution, meaning a kind of normal feature of the life of the church. Later that same year, on the Feast of Pentecost, Pope Francis presided over a gathering of new movements in the Catholic Church in St. Peter's Square where he said memorably that leadership in the church should not be for life. Said there is no leadership for life in the Catholic Church. He said that is a hallmark of dictatorships. 
and it shouldn't be like that in the community of the people of God. Now, flash forward to this recent conversation with the Jesuits in the Congo, and the Pope's tune was somewhat different. I mean, once again, certainly complimenting the courage Benedict had shown in deciding to step down when he felt he no longer had the force to lead, the physical strength to lead. But the Pope was much more dim about the idea of papal resignations becoming a regular thing. He said that, in fact, it should not be regular. It should be an exception, and that, in general, it should be for life. And he actually applied the same point to the position of the Jesuit general superior who by tradition over the centuries since Ignatius Loyola has always reigned for life until the last two Jesuit generals, that is fathers Holvenbach and Nicola, who both decided to step down to make way for, their, for the election of a successor while they were still alive. Francis said he didn't really cotton to that either. He said, you know, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm a little bit of a conservative on this, but I think these offices should be for life. Now, you know, that's not necessarily a direct contradiction with what Francis had said earlier in his papacy, but certainly is a different emphasis. You know, early on, he seemed to say, hey, resignation is a good thing. It's going to become normal. We should all get used to it. Now he's saying it should be an exception, and that at least in his case, he's not contemplating it. What changed? Well, you know, one thing is he simply got more, more miles on the tires, right? He's been pope for 10 years. That's going to give him a different perspective on leadership than the one he came into office with. And of course, over the course of those 10 years, he also had the experience of 10 years of living with a retired pope, you know, living cheek by jowl with Pope Benedict in the Vatican. And we all know that relationship, while very warm and positive on a personal level, came with its tensions politically, theologically, ecclesiastically, those tensions erupted into full public view immediately after the death of Pope Benedict XVI with the release of all of these kiss and tell books from people close to Benedict, alleging a great sense of, what, disappointment, sadness, regret about ways in which Pope Francis has departed from the legacy of Pope Benedict. Remember, this conversation in the Congo was basically just a month after all of this happened. Perhaps no great surprise that Pope Francis's early enthusiasm for the prospect of papal resignation may have shifted a bit given his decade of experience with the reality of having both a resigned pope and a reigning pope. Now, whether that is actually the explanation for what's going on or not, we don't know. It's a little bit of armchair psychology, frankly. But in any event, it simply is striking that Pope Francis is taking a much dimmer and more restricted view of resignation from the papacy today than he was 10 years ago. All right, we shift to the tribulations of the trial. So the Vatican's trial of the century, this, what would you call it, mega process involving charges of embezzlement and other forms of financial crime against 10 defendants, including for the first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, Cardinal Angelo Becciu. For the Pope's former chief of staff, lumbers, lumbered on this past week. The trial held, I believe I'm correct in this, it's 45th and 46th hearings since it began a couple of years ago. First up this past week, we heard from Jean-Baptiste de François. He is a French economist and banker who is currently the president of the Institute for the Works of Religion, better known colloquially as the Vatican Bank. De Franceau was testifying about what led the Vatican Bank in 2019 to make a report to Vatican prosecutors about this transaction in London, this real estate deal in London, where the Secretary of State ended up spending about $400 million, of which it lost more or less half trying to buy a piece of property in the posh London neighborhood of Chelsea. They had approached the Vatican Bank for a loan. The Vatican Bank looked at the proposal, did its due diligence in the end, thought something fishy might be going on, so they flagged it for Vatican prosecutors. That's what prompted the investigation and eventually the trial that we are currently witnessing. De Franceau testified 
that as the Vatican Bank was doing its due diligence, he was repeatedly pressured by officials from the Secretary of State and also the Vatican's Financial Information Authority, its anti-money laundering watchdog, to try to sign off on this loan that the Secretary of State wanted. Now, the reason that that might not be great news for the prosecution is that the various officials, mid-level officials, who have been charged in this thing, some of whom are lay Italian businessmen who are consultors or business partners for the Vatican, other of them are lay and clerical Italians who actually work within the Vatican and the Secretary of State. What they are charged with doing, basically, is pulling the wool over the eyes of the people in charge, that is, the Pope and the top officials at the Secretary of State, conning them, in effect. So testimony that those top officials actually were trying to put the screws on the Vatican Bank to get this deal done may suggest that they weren't quite as out of the loop as the prosecution case wants you to believe. The other hearing we had involved testimony from two bishops in Sardinia, because Cardinal Bechu, actually the charges against him in this trial don't mostly have to do with London. They have to do with claims that he illicitly diverted Vatican money to support a Catholic charity in his native Sardinia run by his brother, Antonio Bechu. Two bishops of this diocese, Ozieri in Sardinia, one a former bishop, one the current bishop, both testify that this charity is completely above board. They said Bechu never pressured them to do anything, and that the money, the limited amount of money they did get from the Vatican is still in the account of the diocese of Ozieri, and that Bechu's brother didn't get a dime of it. That obviously doesn't help the prosecution case either. One other bit of news out of the trial is that the presiding judge, Giuseppe Pignatone, said on Friday that they had originally hoped to wrap up this case by the summer. He now, he conceded it now seems unlikely that they're going to be able to do that. They're going to have to put off the defense summation and so on until the fall. Pignatone said they're hoping to have this all wrapped up by the end of the year. You know, what, if anything, will result that is, whether, whether we're going to see a molehill at the end of this mountain or something bigger than that, that obviously remains to be seen. Okay, so third up this week, who done it? The case of Father Marco Rupnik is one that has kind of traumatized the Vatican in recent weeks and months. This is the famous Slovenian Jesuit artist who makes these mosaics, often drawing upon imagery and themes out of Eastern Christianity. His work has appeared in the National Basilica, the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in D.C., the Redemptoris Mater Chapel inside the Vatican, and many points beyond. Founder of a Center for Art and Theology in Rome, and a very well-connected figure in Vatican circles. Also a Jesuit, like the Pope. So, it emerged earlier this year that late last year, actually, that Rupnik has been accused of various forms of sexual abuse and misconduct. It began with a charge that he had committed the grave canonical crime of absolving his accomplice in a sexual sin in the confessional. That is, of using the confessional to absolve an accomplice in a sexual sin. Later, it emerged that several members of a women's religious community in Slovenia, the community of Loyola, for which he was sort of the spiritual sponsor and patron, have accused him of various forms of abuse and misconduct. And that is also being investigated. Now, here's what has happened this past week. Catholic University in Brazil, the University of Paraná, which had awarded Rupnik an honorary doctorate for his contributions to art and theology, announced this past week that its faculty has unanimously voted to rescind that honorary doctorate, that is to withdraw it on the grounds that, based upon what we now know, Rupnik is unworthy of that honor. And that news has sort of revived attention to the Rupnik case. And the question that everyone seems to be, answer, seems to be asking right now boils down to a whodunit case. Here's the TikTok. We know that this charge 
that Rupnik used the confessional to absolve an accomplice in a sexual sin. We know that that surfaced in late 2018, that it was looked into by the Jesuits and by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican in 2019. We know that in January of 2020, an excommunication was imposed on Rupnik with the investigators having determined that the charge was likely true. And we know that that, that a formal decree of excommunication was issued by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican in May of that year, and that it was rescinded, formally rescinded, later that same month. Question is, who made the decision to rescind this decree of excommunication? Well, there's a very short list of people who could have done it. It could have been Cardinal Luis Lodari, a Spanish Jesuit who runs the congregation, which is now the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. But, you know, other people speculate it might have been the Pope himself, even though Pope Francis, in an airborne news conference, has said that this entire Rupnik case was a complete surprise to him and that his only rule was to decree that when the subsequent charges of abuse about that community of women in Slovenia came up, that they would be heard by the same tribunal that had heard the first charge. So that otherwise it would have gotten confusing if you had two different investigators, two different tribunals looking at the same guy, the same defendant. So this question of who it was who intervened to lift the excommunication of Rupnik, it is to this point a question without an answer but should it emerge that the Pope or someone close to the Pope acting on his behalf was involved, that certainly, at least from a PR point of view, would be a damaging revelation. The Jesuits, by the way, have vowed to conduct a thorough internal investigation of how the Rupnik case has been handled, and their report is supposed to be issued sometime this month, sometime in February, so obviously we'll keep our eyes peeled for that and you'll have full coverage of it on the Crux site. All right, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we are getting very close to the 10-year anniversary of Pope Francis's election to the throne of Peter a decade ago, and that is prompting all kinds of reflection and sort of pondering among the class of Vaticanologists, that is, people who sort of professionally or just out of interest devote their time to trying to make sense of this place. One question very much in the air, whenever a pope reaches the 10-year mark, right, you begin thinking about what might come next. And so inevitably, even though right now it looks like Francis is full steam ahead, folks, I mean, you know, he's got a Senate of Bishops later this year, another one next year in 2025, he's got the Jubilee that he's gearing up for. You know, he's talking about trips over the next couple of years, so there's no indication that there's going to be a transition anytime soon. But nevertheless, you know, when you hit the decade mark, you start thinking about if this were to happen, you know, who might come next? And as people in and around Rome are having that conversation these days, it is somewhat difficult for them to come up with who the credible opposition candidates might be. That is, it's pretty easy to spot who in the College of Cardinals these days would represent continuity with Pope Francis. But who is a credible candidate that would represent discontinuity, a kind of change in direction, if that's what the cardinals are in the mood for whenever the next conclave occurs? I mean, you know, in 2005, when John Paul died, you had in that college of cardinals guys like Danales of Belgium, Martini and Tedemanzi of Italy, Lehman and Casper of Germany, all of whom would have been center-left figures who clearly represented a kind of change in direction and all of whom at that time, you know, were considered to have the, the gravitas, the seriousness, to be a potential pope. Who are those figures today? Honestly, it's pretty difficult to find them. And here's one reason. Pope Francis from the beginning has taken the position that he doesn't want to just make cardinals in the usual places, the kind of established centers of power. Instead, he wants to use the cardinal's red hat to reach out to the peripheries of the church, to lift up people and places who are normally overlooked. Now, that is a noble intention and one that certainly speaks to the global character 
of the Catholic Church in the early 21st century, but what it means is that lots of prelates who under other circumstances would already be cardinals have not yet gotten the red hat, including at least five that I can think of that would make obvious sort of center-right candidates for change in the next conclave. Who are these guys? I would give you Archbishop Anthony Fisher of Sydney in Australia, Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles in the United States, Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama in Abuja in Nigeria, Archbishop Marek Jedorowski in Krakow in Poland, and Archbishop Emeritus Tadeusz Kondraszewicz in Minsk in Belarus. All five of these are prelates who, you know, whether you agree with them politically or not, they would be considered to have the formation, the intellect, the experience, the gravitas, the seriousness to the profile as a possible pope. And they all would represent a somewhat more conservative position than Pope Francis. So if they were cardinals, they would probably be on a lot of handicapping lists. Now, some might ask, well, but you know, you don't have to be a cardinal to be elected pope, right? I mean, under church law, the only requirements are that you have to be male, you have to be baptized, and you have to be male. Could be anybody. Well, that's true. But on the other hand, you know, let me just point out, the last time that a pope was elected who wasn't a cardinal was 1378. It was the election of Urban VI, and that election triggered the Great Western Schism and the Avignon Papacy. So, you know, not exactly the most promising precedent in church history, and one that, you know, at least some electors might not be anxious to repeat. You know, we'll see how it plays out. All right, and finally this week, while we're doing Pope at the Decade Mark Reflections, one thing that I decided to look back at this week were the Pope's trips, Pope Francis's trips. Over the last decade, he has taken 40 international trips, visiting 61 countries. And, and here's my theory, okay? It's a theory that I came up with during the John Paul years, and I think it's equally valid under Pope Francis, which is papal trips are a bit like blind dates, okay? Some of them you remember forever, right? You couldn't forget them if you tried. And that's either because they were so great or because they were train wrecks. But either way, they were memorable. Others, you kind of forget five minutes after they were over, right? Now, some of Pope Francis's trips clearly fall into that second category. I mean, Pope, the Pope went to Sweden. The Pope went to Albania. The Pope went to North Macedonia. Now, unless you were actually on those trips, I defy anybody to recall even one thing that happened during any of those three trips. You know, frankly, they came, they went. There wasn't a great deal of hoopla. However, I'm going to contend that there were at least five trips that Pope Francis, undoubtedly there were more, but I think the top five trips he has made, for which there continue to be echoes and there continue to be a historical footprint, I will give you are these. First, his trip to Chile. Let us remember that at the time Pope Francis went to Chile, the country was in the grip of a full-blown clerical sexual abuse crisis. Prior to arriving in the country, the Pope was kind of in denial about the whole thing. Felt the bishop who was at the eye of the storm, Bishop Juan Barros, had been unjustly accused of being linked to that country's most notorious pedophile priest, Father Caradima, and was stunned by the buzzsaw that he ran into in Chile, that is the smaller than expected crowds, the hostility he got from the press and, and frankly often in the street. And on the back of that experience, he changed course. He dispatched investigators to Chile and a couple of months after he returned, all the country's 33 bishops en masse submitted their resignation to Pope Francis. He has in effect rebuilt the church from the ground up. All of this because of, well, basically a bad blind date right? He had a bad time, and he wasn't expecting to, and that sort of jarred him to take a deeper look at what was actually going on. All right, fourth place, I would give you his trip to the United Arab Emirates. This is where he met the grand imam of the, or grand sheikh of the Al-Azhar University and Mosque Complex in Cairo, often called the Vatican of the Sunni Islamic world. 
the two leaders signed the document on human fraternity, which is basically the blueprint for Pope Francis in his interfaith outreach, especially his outreach to the Islamic world, which has been so much at the heart of his interfaith agenda since the beginning of his papacy. That document on human fraternity was also the rough draft of the Pope's encyclical Fratelli, Fratelli Tutti, which came out not long afterwards. It is, in a sense, a synthesis of the Pope's vision for a world based on fraternity and solidarity rather than a world premised on division. So that trip and the document it produced, certainly an important one. Third place, I would give you the Pope's trip to the Central African Republic. It was the first time, historically, that a Pope has ever visited an active war zone. And on the back of that trip, it was so successful that the Pope actually, some would say, was responsible for the fact that a few months later, the Central African Republic was able to conduct largely peaceful elections and engineer a peaceful transfer of power. Now, that peace has not always held since, but the fact it was possible at all, many people would credit to the Pope and the example he set while he was in the country. And, you know, I mean, for a Pope who took the name Francis, right, Obviously, trying to be a peacemaker, a pope of reconciliation and of dialogue, is going to be at the core of his agenda. Nowhere was that on more clear or effective, arguably, display than his time in the Central African Republic. Second, I will give you his very first trip outside of Rome, July 2013, when the pope went. It was four hours, but they were enough. He went from Rome to Lampedusa. That is an island in the Mediterranean, the southernmost point of Italian territory. It's actually closer to Nisia than it is to Sicily. But it's Italian territory, and it is a primary point of arrival for all the migrants and refugees who were trying to get into Europe from Africa and the Middle East. The Pope went to Lampedusa that day to visit the badly overcrowded detention center there. This was even before the peak period of the migrant and refugee crisis in Europe, but nevertheless, it was still bad. He spent a couple, he spent an hour and a half speaking with these people, embracing them, wiping away their tears, and hearing their stories. He also got on a boat and laid a wreath in the sea to commemorate the roughly 20,000 people at that point a decade ago who were believed to have lost their lives trying to make the crossing over the Mediterranean to get to Europe. It was the first time he used the rhetoric of a throwaway culture versus a culture of encounter. In other words, this was the social and political agenda of this papacy in miniature. It was all there in that initial outing from, from Rome to Lampedusa. So much so that for Italians, the word Lampedusa has come for Pope Francis to be much like the word Gettysburg for Americans with President Lincoln. That one moment, that speech that President Lincoln delivered that day at Gettysburg summed up his legacy in the same way that those four hours of Pope Francis at Lampedusa in many ways sum up his. And then finally, the Pope's number one most impactful trip, March 2021, his trip to Iraq. First trip after the COVID pandemic. Many people felt this trip would never take place, that the security situation was too dicey, the health situation because of the pandemic, the Pope's own health because of his limitations and difficulty, the cost of it all, on and on and on, all kinds of reasons. Francis, nevertheless, was determined to go. The highlight of that trip was his meeting with Ayatollah al-Sistani, the leader of Sunni Islam. The Pope went to the holy city of Najaf, met al-Sistani in his residence. The two men embraced and issued a joint rejection of religious extremism and violence. The fact that the Pope delivered that message with al-Sistani in Iraq the country arguably on the face of the planet, more than any other, that has been torn apart by sectarian hatred and violence justified in the name of faith. The towering significance of that simply cannot be forgotten. Iraq has designated the anniversary of the Pope al-Sistani meeting as a national holiday. It is the National Day of Tolerance and Coexistence. It has not completely changed the equation in Iraq, of course, but nothing provided a more powerful counter-narrative to the idea that religion inevitably 
stokes hatred and violence than the sight of those two spiritual leaders standing together shoulder to shoulder and cheek by jowl articulating a future of peace dialogue and mutual respect all right that is our show for this week as ever you can find full coverage of these stories on the crux site that is cruxnow.com your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart wired independent catholic journalism we will be here with you again next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again very soon.